Hello, everyone. We're just getting everyone in from the waiting room. Hold on. A few more coming in. Thank you for joining us on this lovely Tuesday. It is very nice out, at least up in Ipswich. And everything. Okay. Look at this, that young Marty Klein. Who? Oh, I would just like to make an announcement to everyone that uh, Marty was given an honorary degree from UNH. He got hooded uh, last weekend, right? <laughs> The good kind of hooding. <laughs> yes, 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 no, you, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 yeah. So, so uh -huh. he's now technically like a UNH grad, it's awesome. Uh -huh. I still like you, Marty, though. I, I know, poor Marty <laughs> is muted and can't like, you know, <laughs> defend himself for all the embarrassment. So, okay. Um, I think we got everyone else in here. Um, Vic, what? Um... I have a bunch of announcements. Yes. Um, I'm Vic Maston. I'm the chapter chair, as well as the president of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And I've got several announcements to make. One is for the chapter. Our elections are complete. Uh, the slate was <laughs> once again placed it, reelected. Um, we're still looking for volunteers to take over, but uh, I will still remain as chair, Lindsay as vice chair, Dick Miller as secretary, and Dave McKenna as our treasurer. Uh, for you that are our members of the chapter or would like to be members, this is renewal time. We need that $6 for our annual uh, membership. So if you're really interested and want to support the chapter, we'd, we'd like to take your money, as well as the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Um, We'd also encourage you to become members because of the digging in series, as well as this. Uh, the society always needs money. Uh, and if you, if you join now, you're gonna see a much improved bulletin, uh, which I think we've, we've been having a lot of uh, compliments on the quality of articles really improving and the, and the re reach of articles. Finally, the Robbins Museum, the Society's Robbins Museum of Archeology span will be reopening on Saturdays only starting on May 29th. For the month of June, admission is free. So we encourage you to visit and, and patronize our bookstore. And that's what I have. Uh, I don't believe we have any other, oh yes, finally, the next, after this, we have the summer hiatus or sabbatical or recess, and we will resume meetings on September 21st, 2021. I have not spoken with um, Dr. Wheeler, whether we'll do any in-person or not for the fall semester but uh, we'll still start the lecture series and we'll probably stay uh, at least as Zoom for a short amount of time. Yeah. So thank you for uh, tuning in tonight for, for Alicia's presentation. So Lindsay, take it away. Okay. So we are very excited to have uh, Alicia Carsey here. Uh, her, oh God, I always mess up your last name. I uh, see. Uh, Tracy. Thank you. I always mess it up. Um, she is a registered professional archaeologist with 25 years experience in cultural resource management at the private, state, and federal level, and she has worked for private firms, municipalities, the Massachusetts Historical Commission, and the National Park Service. She is currently the curator of archaeology for the National Park Service, covering the area from Maine to Virginia, and she has worked in nearly all of the 90-plus national, nationally significant sites, including Jamestown, Gettysburg, Minuteman, National Park and the home of Rockefeller, Longfellow, Teddy Roosevelt, Thomas Edison, and more. Um, located in Boston, um, she is the director of an archaeology lab and has been advising on archaeological collections management and their importance. Um, and during her career, she has excavated sites 10,000 years old and as recent as September 11th, 2001. Um, as museum curator, Alicia has been involved in many aspects of professional museum work, and she and her team help parks with the, with the pack and move of museum collections, planning museum storage spaces, rehousing objects such as textiles, rare books, manuscripts, and archaeological artifacts. And she is even part of the uh, National Park Service Museum Emergency Response Team and has recovered museum collections after floods, fire, and other disasters. Um, and she has extensive experience in public archaeology, including exhibit design, public lectures, 
like she is doing now. And she's worked on Boston's Big Dig for many years and was a member of the design team for the award-winning museum exhibit, Archaeology of the Central Artery Project, Highway to Our Past at the Commonwealth Museum in Boston. And as a historical archaeologist, Alicia has a strong working knowledge of material culture from the 17th to 20th centuries, specifically ceramics, glass, furniture, and graystone. As the director of her own consulting firm, uh, Parasi, uh, Parisi uh, Preservation Consulting, and she develops management strategies for the preservation of bur burial grounds and uh, conserves historic gravestones. So welcome, thank you, and this is a really exciting topic that uh, clearly from your bio you know a ton about. So. <laughs> sorry you read the long one, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I could have read the short one, but I was like, you know what, I didn't want to cut anything. So. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to come and speak today. This is a um, topic that's very near and dear to my heart um, and I think is very timely right now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Just let me know if you can see it. How's that? Yeah? Okay. As Lindsay said, my name is Alicia Parisi. I work for the National Park Service. I've been there 21 years as a field archeologist and a curator. Uh, so it's important that we take this time to talk about um, the archeology span collections because as we all, you know, archeology span is the study of human behavior based on the artifacts that they left behind. And as we, as we head into what has been well documented for years about the curation crisis, um, the state of affairs in archeological collections and how they um, appear, which is in deplorable condition, the question is what, what, is, what is that saying about us as professionals, right? It, 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 it begs the question. Um, so while shortage of space has been at the heart of the crisis, there's much more to the conversation. Uh, one is that the immediate recommendation that keeps coming in is, well, we should sample down or just not collect. Um, but we have to remember that the creation of a collection by a professional archeologist determines what will be preserved for future research, interpretation, and education. And while the legacy of research archeology span has a dark shadow over it, just gonna gloss right over that. Um, responsible collecting and ethical stewardship are central to every long-term management decision that we make. So in the Northeast region of the Park Service, we have a hundred years of excavation and with significant sites comes early field work. And um, some of that uh, is, there you go. Uh, comes with both field methods and lab methods that were considered groundbreaking at the time. And groundbreaking is also a kind way to say untested methods, right? So with the shorted, with, we've seen all kinds of, of creative ways to get the artifacts processed, um, stored, and with a shortage of space, the, the archeology span collections are always the first ones annexed to basements, attics, crawl spaces, garages, and sheds. We know this, right? Um, I, this is an important picture up here on the left. That's the Jamestown Archaeology Lab in 1938. That's my lab on the right um, in Charlestown. And even the archaeologists have differing opinions about the worthiness of artifacts and collections produced during an excavation. The name of my presentation, A Horrible Quantity of Stuff, comes from a letter from the late and great John Cotter, over here on the bottom left. Uh, the field archeologist, um, at the time, he was excavating a site at Saratoga National Battlefield and sent a letter to another archeologist and said, I really hope you don't encounter a horrible quantity of stuff like I have. And it makes you wonder if the field archaeologists fed dread finding stuff, where's the support for collections? And yet, we all know they won't let go, right? How many project archaeologists have taken artifacts all over the, 
all over the country as they switch jobs and have intended to finish that report. And tracking down these materials is no easy task and getting them to part with it is even harder, uh, especially the field notes. Uh, one really um, advantage to being a federal archeologist is federal law enforcement. Yeah, they're really helpful with the field note parts, yeah. So here's where we get a really bad reputation. Yep, that's my face. Um, here's where we get a really bad reputation. The collections look like this, oh, nearly all of them. Um, and I've done the legwork. This, this isn't anything unusual. Um, and I think most of you would agree. We have overpacked boxes, inappropriate bags, tags. We have artifacts that are bagged wet or whatever that nightmare is in the bag that I'm horrified and looking at. Um, they, ca they captured that perfect moment. And I, I will share a really funny story, which is one of our field archeologists found this photo um, a couple of years ago and sent me an email and said, if you send me $20, I'll, ma I'll make sure this doesn't get out. And I said, oh, oh, I dare you. <laughs> I dare you to send this to the public. I'll tell everybody that you're a deadbeat dad and you don't send in your field notes or finish any of your, of your collections. And he was like, wrong number, sorry. Yeah. Um, so with, with the cataloging curation coming at the end, it is the, obviously the first thing to be cut short. The budgets run out and... Um, this, this is where they cut corners. You know, a lot of the contractors, um, whether we are contractors, whether we manage contracts, either way, uh, you know, these are for-profit organizations and they have to make money on the project. And yet it's a slim profit margin, right? And something has to give. And it's the collections that really suffer in the end. Um, so, no, like some of the things that, that dominate, right, are unprovenienced bags. We have bags and bags and bags of unprovenienced collections. And the question is, why? Why did you save them? Could you explain yourself? That would be helpful, right? Um, because it was cool? Okay. Um, where are your field notes, right? I mean, I feel like that's going to be on my gravestone when I pass. Where are your field notes, right? Or at least it should be. When we see box after box after box of box of STP one level one, it means nothing, literally nothing. And and when in in these sites where we keep returning, so in, in the park service, you know, we're going back to these same sites over and over. So if if you have a basement fill of filled with boxes that say STP one level one, well, what do you have without field notes? You have no no context in where they belong. If it, so what I always say is if it's important to dig it up, it's important to see it all the way through. Shouldn't be a deadbeat parent. So these, these examples, of course, um, are also all too common. We have a culture of complacency in many ways that we need to be more aware of. You know, there's the everyday limitations that we all have, which is um, limits in funding, staff, time. Um, but we also are up against something difficult, which is, you know, many times we, our profession is seen as a hobby sometimes. You know, we're at odds oftentimes with like, uh, you know, bottle diggers and, um, you know, and in, in, in in the federal government, we have ARPA violations. And the way in which you di differentiate our professional archeology span from digging in the ground is scientific systematic recovery. So where are your field notes, right? So that's, that, that's where we keep coming back to. Um, and the, I guess at the end is, you know, we, we are professionals, but unfortunately the collections that we leave behind are saying something different, right? And the evidence is against us in many ways, in many ways. And this is true of everybody, nobody's being picked on here, right? Um, these collections belong to all of us, especially on public lands for sure. 
And um, it's important that we remember that they are, don't exist solely for one researcher. And yet many of these you open up and it looks like the researcher just split in the middle of a fire alarm or something. Like, you know, once their research interest, once their project was over, it's, they were done. Um, some of these individual choices, like on, on the bottom left, what we have there is um, many archeologists like to organize their collections by collection type. So you have the glass box, the ceramic box, the metal box. And again, to go back to how we all began, it's not necessarily what you find, but where you found it and what you found it with. So if you return, if you put these into collection type by collect by material type, you're artificially imposing this. And then what happens is if you haven't labeled it or the labels fall off, you have orphans and you have nothing. The, re the value of your collection is, is immediately diminished, if not negated. So up here on the left, this is a metal cabinet and they use shipboard trays and you can see they retained water. Many of the artifacts, the labels floated off. So, um, you know, we make a lot of recommendations on it's better to box collections. It's better to make sure everything is labeled. Um, it's better to bag and box everything. Um, they survive, archeology span can survive really well in a lot of the nat um, disasters if um, it's bagged, when it's bagged and boxed. When it's in these kinds of cabinets, it never, it never fares well. On the bottom right, um, this, is, this is really unfortunate. This is a important site, important ceramic collection. And the researcher at the time created this Rosetta Stone of stickers and then tagged each piece. <laughs> yeah. And then for starters, we couldn't find the Rosetta Stone. We, we searched long and hard. And then of course, when they were done, they just boxed it, ditched it in an attic where all the stickers dried out and fell off. So yeah. So it's important to remember that Collections are forever. They don't belong to you or a single researcher. You know, they, they must exist long after us. Um, you know, to get to a place where we are, collections are stable, they are ready and prepared for researchers and uh, accessible, takes money, time, and staff. And, and that's where it falls apart, of course. Um, curation comes to the end. It's the, it's the first thing cut from the budget. And... Um, it, we, with that in mind, we have to remember that we can all make a difference. And that means project planners, PIs, uh, field and lab staff, students and researchers. Uh, some of our behaviors have had long-term impacts and we do, I just showed you many examples of them. And the legacy of bad relationships have an absolute physical, have an impact on museum collections. Uh, two great examples, one, when, um, there's a bad breakup, whether you know professionally or otherwise, and a collection is split into locations or two cataloging systems because they don't get along. It's in every single institution I've seen, and it's um it's unfortunate. So, I'm going to take you through um, a recent project that we're working on, um, with focused specifically on improving the archaeology collections. This is um, Boston African American National Historic Site in Beacon Hill in Boston. The African Meeting House, which is on the right, uh, 1806 is the oldest extant black church building in the nation. It was a place of discussion for many prominent abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, Charles Sumner. Uh, and then on the left, on the bottom here, is the Abel Smith School, which was the first primary and grammar school established for Black children in Boston. All of these sites are linked, are National Historic Sites, and are linked by a 1.6 mile Black Heritage Trail. And the Boston African American site is, was authorized by Congress in 1980 and is managed and coordinated by the National Park Service. Are you confused? Yeah, yeah. So the building on the left, the school is owned by the city of Boston. The building on the right is owned by the Museum of African-American History. And yet all the archeology span 
that's down in the middle of this postage size, size stamp lot, plot of land. It was a hot mess and, here, and I'm gonna show you exactly what I mean. So if you up on the top left, you'll see where it says um, Smith School on the right, that's the school. Then the church is behind it. There's a little lot in between. And then there's behind the stable, there's that back in yellow, that back lot. Where the buildings are, there's no, no open land. So it's a teeny tiny amount of land. Okay, this is important for what comes next. The African Meeting House is one of the, and the Smith School is one of the most um, extensively excavated sites in Boston. Uh, it's been a series of excavations beginning in the 1975, beginning in 1975, um, several um, institutions and contractors came and went. Um, it in many ways was groundbreaking for the field of um, African-American archeology span at its time in the 70s. And um, many, many significant discoveries, many publications, many reports came out and it was all fantastic. But this talk is about collections. So now you're not expected to see these colored lines, they're really hard, so I'm blind. But here's the point. The one on the left is really telling. Okay, so there's the African meeting house in the back lot on the bottom. The pink was done in 2005 by UMass Boston. The orange was done in 1975 to 1986 by a contract company that was run um, by the Museum of African American History. Large date ranges, a lot of different field projects came and went. On, there, so in the middle, on the, the picture on the right, there's that center lot. And to the right is the Abel Smith School. And that is an eight seater privy for the school. And that was excavated by the National Park Service from 1991 to 97. There's a lot of different excavations that happened in here. And the excavations um, resulted, in, you know, in a revolving door of people coming and going and the collections, when everybody was done, it, they took them back home, they wrote their reports, they sent things out to the subcontractors. And in the end, the collections ended up in 19 different locations, different states, they went, they went all over. And no one person could really answer to where everything went. Um, essentially 19 different formats, 19 different, uh, cataloging systems and it, it, was, it was, it rendered so much of the research, so much of the report, um, I don't want to say meaningless, but it, it, put, it put to question a lot of the conclusions that are coming out, not all of them, but um, so how I got involved is I was a field archaeologist with the Park Service in the 90s and I worked for the museum I later went on to work for different CRM firms, Mass Historical Commission, like Lindsay said, and everywhere I went, I saw a box of the African Meeting House or the Smith School. It was just everywhere. So um, five years ago, the Park Service began a new fund source um, called Civil Rights Initiative, and it was offering funding to do any kind of work on cultural resources. And I immediately thought of this project. I, I knew these collections would never ever find their way together, find their way home. Um, and I, I just took a chance. And because it's on federal land, it, it, it was a little risky, but the park service administers it. So I just went for it. And in the last five years, um, we've received $350,000 to, um, to work on this project and, and these are the goals um, in, in my proposal. One was to locate these scattered collections in 19 locations. Two, create a unified catalog of artifacts, create physical and digital repository of all the documentation, including gray literature, just find everything. Um, use these lessons learned to teach collections management at UMass Boston. So 
I observed that there is a gap in the curriculum and, and in general, in our profession, um, people aren't really trained in collections management. You can get a degree in archeology span with a lot of emphasis on field um, school and technical field study, or you can get a degree in museum studies, which doesn't really focus a lot on museum um, archeological collections. So this in the middle really, there was a gap. Um, and I knew we could use this because we have the um, UMass Boston has a great archaeology program locally that we, we could develop this project. Um, we wanted to get the BOAF archaeology on the map, get it out there because there's so much research to be done. And we wanted to recruit help from the Society of Black Archaeologists. Uh, it was so important that they, that they know the resource exists because nobody in the museums, in the park, in park service, anybody barely knew that they are, they didn't even know they had archeology. span So how can anyone research it if they don't know it's there? Um, we wanted to do, conduct and present new research and of course can advocate for community outreach. So here's, here's a few members of the team, you'll see more later, but basically we put together a team um, oh, in the five years, about 10 people have come and gone. And um, it's a dynamite team. I, I can't say enough about them. And as I said, the, the focus really was in making sure that um, we, we worked on the BOAF collections, but it was so much more than that. Um, I, I, we, I can say what we taught them in terms of collection management, the skills and the technical skills, but um, you know, how to cavity pack. Everyone's really excited to cut foam with a foam knife and, you know, right. And um, we, but we also did um, intensive um, studies on identification of material culture, on identifying and dating material culture. And um, I gave them every opportunity to go with me on any kind of project in the park service. So we went and we did historic housekeeping. We did pack and move a museum collections. Somebody needed help with an inventory. Who wants to rehouse textiles? Yeah, everybody was like, I will. And um, there are different fund sources for projects when they go in that. So not to be confused, but they got a really good, um, well-rounded training in um, museum training but 99% of their time was on um, collections management. So what I kept hearing is 19 locations, like 60 boxes, and, and it's only referred to as 60 boxes. There's really no emphasis. Nobody knew what was in there. And um, the excavations from 75 to 86, we couldn't find a photo. We, couldn't, we could find very few field notes. Um, so it was sort of a big mystery. Um, the majority of the artifacts that came out of those excavations were from 1806 to 1840, and they are just divine, right? Uh, I mean, the enthusiasm in the lab, everybody just freaked out. But remember that, you know, what we considered once considered to be best practices has changed dramatically. So we have things glued with duco cement, we have things taped, we have, there's a lot of things that could be undone, can't be undone, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned here. And one thing I can say is the best teachable moment is every time the students would open a box and say, again, or where are the field notes? This makes no sense. I don't know what this abbreviation means. And we would have that moment to say, don't use abbreviations in the field. They don't make any sense, only to you, right? And you know, if you glue something back together, the final repository is the one that has to you know, accommodate it in their storage space. And you don't need to do that in this day and age. We can determine minimum vessel counts Right, uh, so those teachable moments um, were critical. And while those artifacts are super sexy and they are, and we loved them, the material culture packed a true punch when it came to um, reminders of social justice. Um, and this is an example of five of eight slate pencil fragments that came from the Smith School. 
in comparison to the industrial school for girls excavated by um, Joe Bagley, city archaeologist, and uh, 399 fragments were found. The school provided for the girls um, in Dorchester and the um, African-American kids had to bring their own and therefore they used all of these right down to the nub and very few were dropped or lost. This, um, this was a paper we presented at um, Society for Historic Archaeology Conference and this is a mostly intact porcelain plate um, found on the surface. I don't know what surface means and I can't imagine how, I can't even understand it. So the first, my, my first instinct was, where are the field notes? But there are no field notes. So a short explanation of this is the Porcellian Club in, at Harvard, it's just the finals club, uses this symbol and has been in operation for a very long time and has commissioned their own tableware. Why this plate showed up at the African meeting house was mostly a mystery. And the best we can tell is that, um, you know, the African meeting house went through a period where it was also a Jewish synagogue, but the Porcelain Club did not allow, uh, admit Jewish members until later half of the 20th century. And the first black member was admitted in 1983. And in the time of us writing this, there is, there's so much uh, controversy going on in the news. Um, you can look that up. I, it, it, it was a sordid past. What this plate was doing at the African Meeting House was a mystery, except one connection is that um, hanging at, at their headquarters was this was this photo of their butler and it tells a um they would call, refer to him as lewis and there's a document very well documented that they gave him gifts they considered him part of the family or, or you know the the group and and there is evidence that around this time based, based on arche other archaeological deposits he was there during a celebration of the african meeting house um the the information that came out about Boston, about these two communities in the 19th century, uh, was it, it's just, just alarming. And all from collections of boxes of things that nobody, people had just literally written off. Um, Dania Jordan, um, I, I recruited um, very early on to come and work on this project. She's a member of the Society for Black Archaeologists. She did an extraordinary job writing her thesis on the Abel Smith School. And she was able to show that um, many of the bottles that showed up in the privies uh, indicated um, that it was not just a school, that they were administering medicine to the students to keep everybody healthy. Um, and um, her reinterpretation of these sites is, is just significant and a reminder that research is forever ongoing. And the more we include descendant communities, the more we include other perspectives, everything changes. So the collections need to be stable and accessible and cared for, for that opportunity. Um, again, more research on personal adornment and we were able to take the collections and compare them to the archival records about what, what was being sold by many of the black entrepreneurs on the street at the time. They had shops and we were comparing things back and forth. Um, unfinished work included um, a nightmare amount of soil samples, which we all of course see. Um, I'm often asked about the boxes of dirt that live in my um, storage space. And I, you know, I hate that because we, we're more than boxes of dirt. We really are. But we do get a bad rap because we have so many soil samples that have no plans for processing. People, when I ask, you know, why'd you take all these soil samples? They're like, I don't know. That's what you do as an archaeologist. That's a terrible answer. 
So, and then do you have to take these huge bags of dirt? I don't think so. Um, so, however, um, the archeologist in me always defends the cultural and scientific value of soil samples, of course. And in this case, we processed them all. There was 35 different types of plants, including raspberries, apples, mustard, tomato, mustard seeds, tomatoes, walnuts, and it suggests a balanced and nutritious diet of a variety of fruits, vegetables, spice, and nuts. We even found a coconut shell. We found beautiful seed beads and textiles. Uh, many of the beads matched, um, not these specific ones here, but there's this um, straight pins as well, but many of the beads match um, ones found at the African burial ground, which is another collection that's, um, uh, you know, is one of our sites in the National Park Service and came through our labs, which was very exciting. Uh, one of the biggest reminder, I think, is that research on collections is not one and done, as I said. You know, we are always aiming towards an integrated interdisciplinary study, right? And there are new sites always being found. There's new technology always being found. And using these technologies and comparing them one to another changes everything. And unless we preserve that collection that someone studied in 1975, there's nothing, there's nothing to compare it to. And that's an, that's an important reminder. Um, we have done our due diligence in getting this collection out. Um, some of the conferences we partnered with um, Joe Bagley and Harvard University to do a whole session on schoolhouse archaeology. On the bottom, we gave a um, workshop on identifying historic ceramics and many of the collections um, of the sexy collections from the African Meeting House we used. And it was great to, to get them out there. The collections have also made their way into um, the media um, public realm. So here we did social, like Facebook posts, blog posts. We even created a coloring book, um, the ABCs, and several of the artifacts that came from BOAF made it in there. Um, in this case, the um, S is for shell. And um, the interp staff at the National Park Service who had no idea the archeology span existed, really, really became so excited that now they have something called um, Smith Court Stories and the, the website's up there. So if you wanna look at it um, in more detail and they have um, great stories and, and they list the assets. It's been a long time since I've seen archaeological objects listed as an asset. I was so excited to see this. I, I, I can't say enough. Um, and they really, they went into, um, they used our photos. We created a digital um, archive and they, they took all of our, our, our data and they put it out there in the public to share. And that and to us was like a, just a major, major success. Lastly, as we look to having these conversations about um, new, about collections of underrepresented communities involving more descending communities, we have to remember how much representation matters, right? And having Denia um, go and speak with many in, in the community outreach made, made all the difference. And this is the Urban Archaeology Corps, and they went and talked to them about archaeology. And they, you know, one of the one of the kids basically said, "I didn't know women were archaeologists. I didn't know. I didn't know I could be an archaeologist. Um, I thought that was a job for white men. I mean, things that will that will stay with me forever. And um, it's just a great reminder that." It is our job to invest in the next generation. It's our, it is our job to, to show them what they can be. Um, and, and this collection really helped us do for sure. So, thank you. Thank you, this was awesome. Um, so yes, if anyone has questions for Alicia, you can put them in the chat and I will relay them. Um, Hold on, let me just change my gallery view. Um, so, couple questions. 
One is, what is the most interesting object you have found in any of the other collections that you've looked at? Oh, like ever? Yeah. What's, the, what's, the <laughs> cool, what's your favorite? What's the coolest thing? Um, I don't know why every time I'm asked this, I like blank, right? How about the most memorable thing I ever found, which was yeah. a live grenade? <laughs> okay, that was another question. Have you found live ordinances? And if so, how did you deal with it? Probably with the bomb squad, legit. It was a nightmare. And we had to call the Boston bomb squad. Yep. And, um, and everybody was out of, like a lot of people were out of the office. And so I had to call law enforcement and they were really blase about it. They were like, calm down. And I was like, um, you know, you should really come. They did. They freaked out, called the bomb squad. The bomb squad came and just like um, trashed our lab for lack of, you know, they really did made a, made a big um, brouhaha about it. We ended up on the news. It was like so stressful. But what I can say is there were a lot of teachable moments in that. Um, one is don't collect ordinance, obviously. Um, this was a really old legacy collection. And I was questioned like, who sent this to you? And I was like, I brought it here myself. I drove over every single pothole from Staten Island to here. <laughs> and um, that was that was really, um, that's pretty memorable. And the other thing um, is, you know, it was told, we were told it was called and the field note that was with it, which is like a post-it note said, um, like, uh, most likely waterlogged found one of 11 or one, one of 11. Now, I don't know what everyone else's inter uh, take on this is. Where's the other 10? Well, well, my take on this, right, was they only kept one. I just knew in my heart that they had sampled and only kept one of the 11. I don't know where the other 10 is. It's a nightmare. But many of these national park sites have been testing grounds for live ordinance at different times. And... Um, yeah, yeah, it's bad news. But um, this was an old collection that we picked up, brought all the way to Charlestown, and surprise. So um, the bomb squad was like, you know, uh, you, you need to step aside as a serious matter. And I was like, I called you, calm down. <laughs> um, okay, so um, to answer Bill's question, yes, this uh, lecture is being recorded and will be available on the MAS uh, YouTube page. Uh, which is massarchaeology.youtube, whatever. Um, so we have a question from David. Uh, he's a retired USDA Forest Service archaeologist, and he was wondering if you in your NPS role, do you provide advice and direction to the Forest Service folks? Um, as he says, they could use it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, just last week I gave a talk to the um, I don't know what they call them, the group uh, organization of federal archaeologists, which was really exciting because it was all the different departments. I got to um, meet a lot of different people and um, talk about, <clears throat> you know, we've we sit through a lot of meetings about, you know, what we what is in our span of control and what is out of our span of control. Like I can't give us more money. I can't give us more staff. What can we change? And we talked a lot about, you know, not paying twice for the lowest bid contract you know so if inspecting collections more closely making sure scopes of work are written better and so i i just gave a talk about that and you know with a lot of real life examples like i i have to do a collection inspection um, for a collection that came back with all the artifacts bagged wet and that have now grown mold so we have to pay or figure out how to handle that right and when contractors get really excited and want to um, reconstruct a milk pan redware milk pan using duct tape the conservation budget is now larger than the original contract because of course that was one of the nationally significant or contributing objects and um, they want to put it on exhibit so yeah, so there's things we can do all of us like right here, right now to save money. We're not going to get more money, but we can make sure we don't, you know, um, we can make our money go further. So, yes, definitely. I, I to the best of my ability, I try to um, reach out when I can and, and, you know, network with the other agencies. And, and I do give emergency response um, training and that's a, 
that's been helpful because you know some of uh, the other agencies like your reclamation is like a department of one person for the whole, like for an entire area and um uh, you know yeah in, yeah and park service gets a lot of staff by comparison yeah um a question i have is um are any of your stuff your you know the national park collections that you oversee in um, museums like the Smithsonian, like I'm thinking like the newest, you know, the African uh, American Smithsonian, like yep. I can imagine like the Abel Smith School stuff would be perfect in there. Yes, they don't know about it yet, but it would be perfect there. Um, other national park archeological sites have made their way there. Um, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, the name of the of course I blanked, but it'll it'll come to me. Yes, yeah, several other important African American archaeological sites um, have made it there, both like um, free black sites and um, you know slave quarters and other. Um, and you know significant things are, are coming up all the time. You know, and the question is, is there staff there to review and, and to understand what they are, mm -hmm. and to, you uh, know to communicate the outside world. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from George. Are you familiar with the Abyssinian Meeting House in Portland, Maine? Only by name. I don't know enough about it, and I would love to speak to them about it. Awesome. From Melina, what is your next big archaeological challenge? Um, all of my staff, right? Um, are project funded and they're on term appointments. And I think the Forest Service will get this. And a term appointment is four years and then it's up. And um, my bit, next big challenge is trying to find a way to restaff my entire program. And um, it, even in the federal government where we're like mandated to keep collections, we have many um, accountability things in place, right? There is steady funding. Even still, we um, are constantly undermined. And, and to bring on a program to mentor students, it takes more than just one person, you know? I mean, um, so that, that is the next big challenge. Also, we have um, COVID put a big wrinkle in everything, as I'm sure a lot of people will agree. And uh, turns out you need to be in person to catalog, right? So you can't telework and call it in. Um, although we made a really cool coloring book, I think you saw. Um, we did the best that we could, but we are behind in a, a lot of our stuff. And so while people are expiring and collections are still not finished, I don't know, I see a lot of late nights in my future. Yeah. Um, Another question is for the general public who are interested in archaeology, um, what suggestions do you have that they could do to like support your work or the national parks archaeological work? Like, you know, talking to people to get you funding or volunteering, yeah. like what, what, how could, you know, just avocational people who are really interested get involved? It's an excellent question and I really appreciate it. Um, you know, many resources, right? Resources require additional resources, right? So um, when you have visitors, they require visitor centers, restrooms, so on and so forth, right? Uh, when it comes to museum collections, cultural resources, they aren't always visible. So we, you don't often get the public support behind that. And, you know, the curation crisis, all that is seen somehow, and for some reason, as a shameful secret. And that, that shouldn't be the case, right? I mean, we should do better, we can do better, but um, really one of the ways is to make sure if, if the public knows you have significant collections, you have collections, period, then they can help you, right? And not everybody has like a giant friends group, right? But public support, you, if you can volunteer, please volunteer. You wanna volunteer in my lab? Absolutely call me. Um, uh, we would absolutely appreciate that. But, um, it, you know, every national park has a collection and needs help. Every single one. Perfect. 
Um, last question, not to play favorites, but do you have a favorite park that you work with? A favorite park? Well, favorite archaeology park? I'm going to have to go with Jamestown. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty special. Yeah, it's pretty That's special. Um, but, you know, I, I really love a, a great furnished Victorian house. And, and I love Glenmont Thomas, Thomas Edison's house. Ooh, that is a nice one. Yeah, yeah. Well, those were the questions we had for you. Thank you for coming uh, and talking to us tonight. Um, and to all our members and, you know, audience, um, we are so excited you ended, you know, the, the, the series with us um, and with Alicia today. Um, we will be back, uh, as Vic said, in September. We don't quite know who we are lining up and everything, um, but we will be sure to get all that information out to everyone. So thank you again. Vic, any last words? Thank you for having me. Everything. So have a good night, everyone. Stay safe this summer and have fun. Bye. Thank you.